So yeah, uh, thanks for coming to my uh, talk today. I'll be talking about reinforcement learning, kind of just giving you like the basics of how it works and uh, the tools that are out there. And um, yeah, trying to just cover a couple of different use cases as I go along. So um, I suppose the first thing to talk about is uh, like, we can make an analogy between reinforcement learning and teaching tricks to a dog. I think that's kind of the, an easy way to get into the topic. So uh, teaching a dog how to do tricks is basically reinforcement learning. So you give it a, a command, for example, you say shake if you wanted to shake your hand. And if it does it, then uh, you give it a treat. So that's kind of the, uh, the reward for having done the correct action. And then uh, like by uh, giving it a treat, uh, it gets something that it likes. So then it's incentivized to do it again. And basically you just keep on doing that over time and the dog should get better and better at doing it and faster and faster at doing it. So basically we just want to do the same thing except with a computer and instead of uh, teaching the, the tricks, we want to do a whole lot of uh, very complicated things. So um, if we look at reinforcement learning at the reinforcement learning problem, this is kind of how you can formulate it. So what you want to do is train an agent to take actions based on observations to extract the maximum reward from the environment. And you can see you've got a couple of key words I highlighted. So I'll go through those one by one to explain what they all mean. So um, you can also see that as the diagram here on the right hand side. So basically the agent is what's actually going to be making the decisions. So for example, if you are creating a robot and you want something to control all the motors, the agent would be what's sending all the motor signals. And if um, for example, you're trying to play an Atari game, it's what's going to decide which button to play on, to push on the, on the control. And so yeah, the agent, the way it interacts with its environment is through actions. Um, so usually actions should be for example, a signal, like a, a motor signal, pushing a button or, or anything like that. So essentially it's just a number at, and it can have more than one, it can do more than one actions usually. Uh, so it can output more than one numbers. So then the environment is kind of the surroundings of the agent. So that can be a virtual or a, could be a physical thing. So if it's a robot, the environment would be literally the uh, physical environment that it's interacting with. If it's a, uh, a video game, then the environment will be the video game and the agent will be what's controlling the controller. So then uh, the environment, what we usually, the environment is very complicated and we use an interpreter. So the interpreter basically is going to look at the environment and extract just the information we care about. And uh, it's going to split that into a reward, which is analogous to the uh, uh, to the treat for the dog and also a state or observation, which is kind of um, values that tell our agent uh, what the environment is like. So that's just a very quick overview. So now I'll go into each one of those things uh, one by one. So the, the first thing is the environment. So like I mentioned before, it can be either virtual, physical, or it can be a combination of both. So a virtual example would be uh, Pac-Man, for example. So you could create a, a reinforcement learning agent and learns how to play Pac-Man. So the environment would be the video game itself uh, with all its internal logic, uh, which you might not have access to. If it's a robot, then um, yeah, the uh, environment would be everything around the robot. And then uh, you might have seen those uh, like uh, quirky 3D models before in the videos online about reinforcement learning. That's a, a, a simulation environment called Mujoko. Uh, it's quite uh, commonly used. Uh, basically, you've got those uh, kind of stick figures and you can teach them how to walk, how to run, how to jump, et cetera, uh, using reinforcement learning. So you'll probably come across those if you start learning about reinforcement learning. So one of the key things about the environment is that it has what's called an internal state. So the internal state is basically well the state of the environment. So for example, if uh, the environment is my desk, then the state will be where is the screen on my desk, where is the computer, where is the, uh, I don't know, the keyboard, etc. what temperature it is, um, how the air molecules are moving. Uh, so there's a whole lot of things. And if it's a real environment, like a, a physical environment, you could have an infinity of a uh, state uh, um, variables. If it's a video game, it's probably a bit more constrained. So you, you know, you've got a, a finite number of things you can look at. But uh, what usually regardless of uh, what type of environment it is, usually it's more complicated than um, 
you can handle. So if it's a real life system, like you probably don't want to care, you don't really care about like the movement of all the electrons. So you probably want to extract only the information you care about from that environment. So yeah, that's a kind of the internal state. So it's usually much more complicated than what you care about. And uh, we want a way to extract just what we can, the information we care about. It. The second thing is that uh, the environment can be affected by the agent through actions. So for example, if I take my desk at the environment and I'm the agent, I can push my screen, I can pick up uh, a, uh, a pen. Um, that's kind of the way I interact with the environment. I can push buttons on my keyboards, et cetera. If uh, you've got a, a video game, then uh, you will probably just, uh, your actions will be maybe a Boolean value for each key on the keyboard. Uh, if you have a robot, your actions will be the voltage applied to all the motors, um, et cetera. So yeah, it's kind of like, so you've got the environment, it's got the internal state and you can affect it using actions. So like I mentioned before, usually the environment um, is too complicated and there, usually it has some aspects of the state that you cannot even measure. For example, you can't measure the position of all the air molecules or if you want to know the, of all the wind, uh, you, it's very hard to know how it behaves. So what we want to do is uh, extract only the information we care about. So in this diagram here, that's the job of the interpreter. So the interpreter looks at the environment and extracts what we care about. So for example, if we had a robot or like we try to make a, a Boston Dynamics Atlas move, we are, so our observations are going to be a subset of the environment that we actually care about. So it could be the sensor measurements. For example, you've got a inertial measurement unit, you've got a, uh, I don't know what else, a full sensor on the feet, you've got uh, a vision camera, uh, et cetera. So you could take those sensor measurements are your observations. It's only a subset of uh, all the states of the environment but it's the subset that you care about and that you can measure. Uh, if you look at a video game example, for example, an Atari video game, so if you go back here, then uh, what usually what is usually done is you take the pixel values of all the pixels on the screen. So like if it's a game that's, I don't know, games like that were probably like, uh, I don't know, 240p. So you've got a 240 by, uh, I don't know, like 500 pixels, um, three values for red, green, blue and you get all of that as the observation and then you try to make decisions based on that so if you move on to the next thing uh, so we talked about uh, the state and how sometimes we just use an observation now we can look at what's called the reward so the reward is basically the equivalent of the treat that you give to the dog so if you want your uh, reinforcement learning agent to get better you need to have a measure of uh, what is good so um, there are two different ways to do this. The first way is called sparse rewards. So that's basically you only give a reward at the end. So for example, you, uh, let's say you have a robotic arm that uh, needs to place a, uh, a pen somewhere. So it starts here and this put it there. Then a sparse reward would be, you only get a reward if you get to the goal. So once you get to the goal, you get plus one. Like literally uh, the reward is just a number. So the number is plus one if you reach the goal. And all, like you can do anything else in between, you're not getting any reward for that. So the good thing about sparse rewards is that you're giving complete freedom to the reinforcement learning agent to find smart ways to solve the problem because you're only giving it a reward at the end. So it can do whatever it wants. As long as it gets to the end, then uh, it gets the reward. And sometimes you can get some very interesting um, behaviors if you do that. However, the, um, the bad thing about sparse rewards is that since you only get a reward when you reach the goal, that means your agent is not going to learn anything unless it stumbles upon the goal by accident. Once it's stumbled upon the goal by accident, then it will start uh, like learning how to get there better and better. However, if your environment is quite complicated, it might just be that it never gets there or it takes so long to get there that uh, it's not practical. So what you always have, well, not always, what you often have to do is add what's called non-sparse rewards. So non-sparse rewards is basically a reward that you get at all times. So for example, if I want my, arm, my robot arm to go from the initial position to the final position, what I could do is that each time step, I give it a reward that's proportional to the distance between the current location and the goal. So if I'm very far from the goal, I get a very small reward. If I'm very close to the goal, I get a very big reward. 
And so now since the agent is continuously getting reward, it's much easier for it to learn. So it's probably going to learn that uh, you know, if it gets a reward as proportional to the distance, it's probably going to want to move in a straight line straight to the goal. However, what ends up happening if you give it uh, too much of those non-sparse rewards is that your um, agent might get stuck or it might learn a uh, suboptimal strategy. So for example, if it always goes in a straight line to the, uh, to the goal, if you add a wall there, then it might just hit the wall and then it just stays there because it doesn't know what to do. Because to avoid the wall, it would have to go further away from the, uh, from the goal. So, and it doesn't know how to do that. So that means you've got to be quite uh, careful on how you assign those non-sparse rewards. And there's quite a lot of papers that talk about it. And uh, there are no, like, there's no really good guidelines that cover every use case. So yeah, you have to be quite uh, uh, careful with those. Okay, so now finally we get to the agents. So we described uh, the that the agent that the agent can take actions, that it can uh, take in observations and rewards. So basically, what the agent needs to do is take in those observations and rewards, and based on those, it needs to decide what's the best action to take. And uh, reinforcement learning is actually quite general. You can apply it on a vast variety of uh, agents, but typically, when we talk about reinforcement learning, we talk about those deep uh, neural networks. So the agent is actually a deep neural networks where the inputs will be the observations um, and potentially the, uh, the reward. And then the output layer will be the actions that you can take. So for example, if you've got a robot, um, the input layer could be, for example, the, uh, the acceleration of one joint, the uh, torque applied to another joint, uh, the force that you sense on the feet. And the output layer will be the uh, comment signals for the modules. If you've got an Atari game, the input layer will be very big. So you're going to have lots of values for all the pixels and uh, all the colors for each pixel. And the output layer is going to be you know, Boolean for each button. So up, down, left, right, and uh, AB probably. And then in between, you've got uh, multiple layers of, uh, neural, of neurons. And I think uh, lots of you already know kind of how uh, neural networks work and how neurons work, but I'm just gonna talk about that briefly um, to then, because it then relates into how uh, one of the algorithms I'm going to talk about works. So if you look at a single one of those neurons, uh, typically it kind of looks like this. So now you're getting a bit of maps, uh, my apologies for that, but essentially the neuron has a couple of different inputs. So if we look here, so that would be in everything, the hidden layers and the output layers of the neuron. So it could have, it can have more than one inputs and then it has one output. Uh, sometimes the output might be connected to more than one other neurons, but it's all just one value. So if you go back here, so you've got several different inputs and then you've got one output here. And this, uh, this inputs and this output are all just uh, you know, floating point numbers. So typically it's a number between zero and one, although it's not necessarily, but usually think of it just about, about a, uh, number between zero and one, where zero is the equivalent to a neuron in your brain not firing, and one is the equivalent of a neuron in your brain firing. There's a bit more complexities here, but uh, that's kind of just a you know, very basic way to look at it. And so the way you get the output for a given input um, in this model of a neuron is you basically apply a weight on, on each input, and the weight is going to tell you um, how important each input of the neuron is so if one input is more important, it's going to have a higher weight. And if it's not important, it's going to have a lower weight. Then you've got this other thing called the bias that you can use. So if this neuron should fire up very often, then you can add a positive bias. If it should fire quite rarely, you give it a negative bias. And then once you've got all of that, so basically what you do is you multiply all the inputs by all the weights, you add all that together, you add the bias on top. And then what you can do is you can pass it through what's called an activation function. Uh, and the activation function basically um, kind of just shapes the, um, the, um, the, this combination. And um, the reason for that is it gives you a bit more, I suppose, a richness in terms of the behaviors your neural network can uh, simulate. So if you just have a uh, linear combination, so if you just uh, multiply all the, 
inputs by the weights and uh, add a bias and then send that to your outputs, you, you are not going to be able to model a lot of different behaviors. Whereas if you add this, the activation function, it makes it a bit more nonlinear and you get a more, like more richness in terms of behaviors. So all of that, just to say that uh, your neuron is going to have some parameters that can change. So the weights, that's all things you can change and the bias is something you can change. And so now if you look back at the whole network of neurons, what we can do is we can just list all the parameters or all, all the weights and biases for all the neurons, put that all in a big vector. So basically just a huge list of uh, all the weights for all the uh, neurons, all the biases for all the neurons. And basically what we want to do when we do reinforcement learning is we want to find the best value for all those weights and the best value for all those biases so that when we get some input, we get the output that gives us the most reward. So essentially we've got a vector and we want to optimize this vector, we want to find the optimal values for all the elements in that vector. And the way uh, reinforcement learning does that really depends on the algorithm. So today I'm just going to talk about one called PPO or proximal policy optimization. Uh, this is a quite recent algorithm from 2017. Uh, it's created by this company called OpenAI, who also created a couple of other products um, like GPT-3. And um, this is an example of what's called a model-free um, reinforcement learning algorithm. So what model-free means is that when you do the training, you don't actually need to know how the environment functions, and you're not even trying to find out. Basically, the only thing you care about is like finding this, these values, these weights and biases that are going to give you the maximum amount of reward. And uh, this is a type of uh, algorithm called an online algorithm. So the way this algorithm works is on live data. So basically, you just have to throw it at the environment and let it learn just by making mistakes uh, after mistake. There are some other algorithms that are offline. And those you can, it's a bit more similar to standard machine learning, where you can give it like a training data set. And then you can you know, train on the training data set and then use that to um, become to create better uh, strategies. And finally, it's what's called a policy gradient algorithm. So I'll talk about that in a bit more detail because those policy gradient algorithms are quite popular. And I think they're some of the easiest ones to understand. Um, it still takes a bit of time to wrap your mind around it, but uh, I think it's as easy as it gets in terms of uh, reinforcement learning. So that's kind of just the, the, the recipe of how proximal policy optimization works. So basically at the beginning, you start with a random policy. So what I mean by that is uh, you take your uh, neural network and you just randomize all the weights and biases. So this big vector, um, you just put random values in there. So just, it's all random. You might have some constraints, but yeah, just some random numbers. And then you just throw that in the environment. So you just start running your environment. For example, you put it on your robot and uh, your robot starts you know, sending random signals to all its models, and it's probably just going to fall over. But then, since it's fall over, you can actually uh, you know, see what's happening and see how much reward you get, and then make decisions based on that. So yeah, the way you do is you start with a random policy. Then what you're going to do is you're going to run the uh, the agent multiple times. So for example, if you had a robot, you just uh, you know put the robot upright, and then you let it do. Uh, it's thing. So the neural network is just going to send signals. Uh, it's going to find get some measurements from the environment, and then a robot is going to fall over. You do that several times because if you just do it once, it's a bit like a sampling uh, when you do an experiment. If you just have one data point that doesn't really tell you how good uh, your experiment is, or like uh, it doesn't really tell you anything. So here, if you want to find out how good your agent is, how good the current weights and biases are, you need to run it multiple times. Um, Sometimes you have to do it a lot of times. So that's a uh, downside of this uh, approach. Like you might have to do it a hundred thousand times to get a good idea of how good your algorithm is. So then after you know kind of how good the algorithm is, what you're going to do is you start with your uh, random uh, policy. So your random vector and you just modify all the elements a little bit and you do that randomly as well. So you just yeah, modify all those elements a tiny bit. So you just add a, you know, plus 1%, minus 1% kind of thing to all of them. And then you do the same thing again. You just uh, run the um, neural network on the system. You see how it behaves. And then you find how good 
the policy is. So you find you calculate the average reward that you get over all those tests. And what you do is quite simple. Basically, you just compare the new reward that you got after making the small change to the reward you got before making the small change. And if you see you get more reward, then uh, you know that you're moving in the right direction. So basically, you just move a little bit more in the same direction. So if you increase the quote unquote, one of the weights by 1%, then you might increase it by 1% again. If you decreased one by 1%, then you decrease it by 1% again. So just move in the same direction because you know, oh, well, I'm getting good uh, results from that. And so uh, one thing to note here is when I say you move more in that direction, uh, there's always a little bit of randomness involved. But uh, what this means when you move more in that direction is that you kind of bias your randomness so that it's uh, biased towards the direction that you found to be good. So you're more likely to like select a random value uh, in the direction that's good. And on the opposite side, if you find that uh, your reward goes down, so the new uh, values you found for the weights and biases are worse than the previous ones, then what you do is you just move in the opposite direction. So if you increase one value by 1%, you just decrease it by 1% this time. And this is actually, uh, like it seems fairly simple, but it's actually quite powerful because it makes the algorithm quite stable because if it takes a bad step, so it's always doing things a bit randomly, but if it changes its uh, weights and biases in a bad way, then it can recover from that by moving away from that. And uh, this is a uh, process called uh, stochastic gradient descent. So there's uh, some randomness involved and you're just, well, this is, sorry, stochastic gradient ascent because you're trying to maximize the reward. So if you want to look that up, uh, it's quite uh, useful in lots of uh, optimization fields. Um, but yeah, basically what you do is uh, you just keep on repeating this recipe until you find that your reward plateaus. So at first your reward may be very bad when you with a robot and just keeps on falling over, you're going to get a very bad reward. Then over time, it should get better. And once it can stand up and maybe walk, if that's what you wanted to do, then you start getting quite a bit of reward. But at some point, it's going to level off. So you can only get so good and you're going to be limited by, uh, you know, maybe the uh, physical system, maybe you're going to be limited by the, uh, the way you chose the, the rewards. Like I mentioned before, um, if you give it too much reward uh, for too many things, then uh, you're going to constrain the behavior quite a bit. And that means, uh, you know, you might get stuck uh, to some uh, level of rewards. So you just, that's kind of how PPO works. Um, you just yeah, do this uh, uh, recursive, um, not recursive, this step-by-step uh, you know, -step algorithm, and eventually you get a good reward if you formulated your problem in a, in a good way. But that's just one type of algorithms. I haven't actually included anything about other algorithms, uh, although might, if you're interested, I could just talk about it a bit after. Uh, but before that, I just I think I'll just talk about uh, tools that are very useful for uh, reinforcement learning. So the first one is OpenAI Gym. Uh, so that's a tool to create environments. So for example, um, you if you have a video game and you want to create a reinforcement learning agent for it, you can't just you know throw the reinforcement learning agent at the video game right away. You kind of have to wrap the video game in a uh, familiar environment that you can then use to interact with uh, reinforcement learning agents. So OpenAI Gym is probably the most widely used uh, of those uh, you know, environment uh, frameworks. So I'd really recommend uh, taking a look at it. It's got quite a bit of support and uh, documentation. So it's always good to have that. And it's quite uh, straightforward to use. Then the next thing, the next tool that can be quite useful is OpenAI Spinning Up. So Spinning Up basically is a repository of simple implementations of uh, a wide variety of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. And when I say simple implementations, I mean that the algorithms are like the algorithms you would find in a journal paper. Whereas uh, if you look at some of the uh, more uh, like highly performing algorithms out there, that, sorry, algorithm implementations out there, they might have lots of uh, you know, low level hacks to run faster. So then it can be very hard to actually understand you know, how it actually works. Well, if you look at spinning up, it's fairly straightforward, so it can be a bit easier. Um, however, the one thing I would mention for that is uh, what I found with reinforcement learning is that um, it takes a lot of time to get to a level where you know enough about the theory um, so that when you look at algorithms, you actually know what to do with them. 
because you can spend a lot of time reading uh, you know, explanations, watching lectures, and then you, you look at the equation and you can understand, oh, this part of the equation does this thing, this part of the equation does that thing. But then it doesn't really tell you how you should you know, tune the algorithm, how you should choose the hyperparameters for it, how you should uh, you know, define the reward functions. So if you have to get into reinforcement learning very quickly, it might not be worth going into that uh, you know, deep uh, you know, theoretical uh, way. It might be faster to just get used to the tools and then uh, learning from trial and error. And then if you want to know how something works, then you look it up. I think that would be a more um, um, a better approach if you want to you know, get started quickly. If you had, for example, a whole master's worth of uh, time to to learn about this, then uh, definitely you know, learn all the theory and learn how you know read papers on how to tune those things. It will definitely help a whole lot. However, the time investment is quite significant uh, for that. So the next tool that's uh, quite useful is uh, called Stable Baselines Three. So that tool here is a uh, it contains state of the art uh, implementation of algorithms. So those are very fast implementation of the algorithms. They might have uh, some uh, you know lots of uh, hacks uh, or you know, optimizations that make it quite hard to understand the code. However, they are very, uh, you know, highly performing. Uh, they're well uh, maintained. Uh, spinning up is, uh, hasn't really been maintained in the past two years, but stable baselines free has still lots of uh, um, maintenance going on and they're adding new um, algorithms. They're also adding examples of trained uh, agents. So you've got lots of support there. And the last, uh, tool that's very useful is Stable Baselines Free Zoo. So Stable Baselines Free Zoo is a, a framework to train agents. So what I mean by that is that it's got all the lots of training scripts, lots of uh, plotting scripts. Um, it's got ways to optimize the hyperparameters of your system. So yeah, when I mean hyperparameters, um, so the parameters of a agent are the weights and biases. And the hyperparameters are the parameters of the algorithm itself. So lots of algorithms can be tweaked in some way. So you've got lots of different things, for example, something called a, a forgetting rate. And the forgetting rate tells you how much you care about uh, immediate reward versus reward in the future. And that's something you can tweak. So those hyperparameters need to be tuned and stable baseline free zoo can do it for you. So of course, uh, it's probably better if you've got some, uh, you know, um, intuitive understanding of uh, what all the parameters do. However, even if you don't have any idea of any of that stuff, you can basically just throw it at a stable baseline free zoo and it's going to try lots of different combinations of hyperparameters and try to find the best ones. So the hyperparameters that will give you the best uh, training performance. So you can train faster, you might get more reward at the end as well. So I think that's it for the main tools. And in terms of resources, so one thing you can look up is uh, David Silver's lectures uh, with DeepMind. So David Silver was the uh, head engineer on the um, Go team. So the team at DeepMind that beat uh, the world champion at Go was led by this guy. And he's got those very good lectures on YouTube. Um, if you just Google his name, uh, you'll find them. Um, and I also saw that DeepMind released a new set of lectures just three weeks ago. So it's each week lecture is about now and there's 13 of them. So it's still a decent chunk of time, but uh, it's not as much as you know, doing a whole uh, course on that. Um, and one thing I found as well is that there aren't really many online courses on, you know, proper online courses like on Coursera on reinforcement learning. You'll find lots of courses on uh, machine learning, deep learning, and all that stuff, but reinforcement learning is still very new. And there isn't really that much in terms of material there. So you kind of have to just find lectures, uh, you know, recorded lectures. So it's like a lecture was given that, uh, it was University College London. Um, so it's just a you know, recording. It's very insightful and the guy is obviously super smart. So it's good to listen to. Um, but yeah, you won't really get uh, you know, a, a full on course experience where you get uh, in the assignments that are automatically read and all that stuff. The other thing is um, reading the documentation for OpenAI Gym and Stable Baseline Spree is very useful. They actually have um, descriptions of the algorithms and it's actually pretty good and they link to papers that are relevant, they link to videos. So looking at documentation is uh, very useful and it's quite, it's pretty good documentation. 
Uh, finally, there's this textbook called uh, Reinforcement Learning, uh, an Introduction by uh, Richard Sutton and uh, Andrew Barto. That's uh, probably the most uh, widely recommended textbook on uh, reinforcement learning. It was originally, I think, from the 90s, but then uh, they released a new version in 2015, I think. Uh, that's uh, much improved. That's got well all the latest technologies as of uh, five, six years ago. Um, so there's been lots of development since then, but if you want to get the theoretical understanding, uh, that's a good book to look at. 